and, and please have a seat and we will uh, continue this uh, program. As you can see, we have here our second panel already in place and we, the, the topic to be discussed is how will an evolving NATO influence the security of Sweden and Finland? Uh, I will just briefly introduce the four persons that you see here, and some of them are very known already, of course. Uh, first, we have here Ambassador Malmqvist, Håkan Malmqvist, uh, who is the permanent representative of Sweden to NATO. Uh, he assumed this duty in September 2014, and before this appointment he served as ambassador to Greece. He has also held the position as director general for the Americas and head of the Americas department, uh, and he has served as deputy uh, director and deputy head of the global security department, among many things. Then we have uh, Ambassador Pirita Asunma, who is the permanent head of mission of Finland to NATO. Uh, she has served as head of, uh, of the mission of Finland to NATO since September 2015 and prior to that she was Finland's representative in the EU's Political and Security Committee. She has also worked in the, in the embassies of Finland in Washington and in Paris. Uh, Jonas Hagren uh, is a rear admiral and head of policy and plans at the Swedish Armed Forces. Uh, he has his background as a submariner. Uh, he has, among other things, been responsible for strategic planning regarding Swedish military deployment in Liberia and uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, he has also served as advisor at the Ministry of Defense, worked with the European Capabilities Action Plan, and served as force commander in the EU Naval Force Somalia. In 2014, he assumed duty as head of policy and plans department of the uh, Swedish Armed Forces. Uh, we also have Charlie Salonius Pasternak, who is a senior research fellow at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Uh, his fields of expertise include United States foreign and domestic policy and Finnish security and defense policy, including peacekeeping and crisis management. He has written numerous publications and is a well-known well commentator, both in Finland and in Sweden, and I'm sure in many other countries as well. Uh, you are so warmly welcome to this discussion, and we look very much forward to listening to you. You will uh, give us like five minutes uh, introduction, introductory uh, remarks, and then we will open up for a joint discussion. Håkan Malmqvist, would you like to start? Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Lena. Thank you, Folk of Schwar, Atlantic Council of Sweden, and uh, not least the Polish Embassy and Ambassador, Ambassador Tarka, who has now left, I think. Um, well, we're competing with the government reshuffle and, and uh, lots of things happening today. The debate on the host nation support. And for those of you who didn't know it, I think tonight there is a documentary on Sweden and NATO on the Swedish television. Um, so it's an interesting day. Um, uh, I think that... Uh, well, after the 40 years of the Cold War, we know that uh, NATO went into the 25 next years of its existence and then the focus won on, was on international missions and out of area operations and, and cooperative security. Uh, and then since 2014, when I happened to take up my present posting, uh, we've been sort of uh, going back partly to the basics, that is collective defense, but the other... Uh, uh, tasks are, are still there, both international missions and cooperative security, and I'll get back to that. And we've heard, I think we had a very good overview by uh, Assistant Secretary General Tildem, Ildem. Um, well, what does this mean? Well, it has affected also the partnership issue, and we, we touched upon that. Uh, um, not, I mean, partners regardless if it's EOP or any other label, partners will be useful and necessary for NATO for the, for the next years to come. Because not only of what is happening in our region now, but also uh, the engagement in, in our neighborhoods or, or the, the periphery of, of, of Europe and, and our, our 
southern neighborhood and our eastern neighborhood. And Ildem touched upon that when he talked about projecting stability. And if you haven't encountered that expression, please get used to it, because it was, will be a lot of that leading up to the Warsaw Summit and also afterwards. Um, it is, of course, uh, a most interesting posting for me. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else, considering the debate we're having on our own security policy, which wasn't there for a long, long time, and all of a sudden it coincided with our own national defense decision for the next five years and uh, the developments, the negative developments in the Baltic Sea region. Um, and I think when I compare to when I took up my position one and a half years ago, our own national debate is a more informed debate. And many of you who are listening here today have contributed to that debate by writing articles or um, publishing inquiries and, and so forth and so on. And, and I think that's good. We need this broad debate on our security policy and the different alternatives on where to go. Uh, and when I look at the... Um, headline, it's evolving NATO effects, how does evolving NATO affect security of, of Sweden and Finland? And maybe uh, next seminar could be uh, turn it around and see how is the evolving Swedish security policy affecting other NATO or, or EU member states. That could also be an interesting take. Uh, but I won't go there. Um, I think we've heard already, and that's the good thing, talking after your own minister, uh, the defense minister, uh, made it very clear, I think, um, our view on, on your question. And for those of you who did, did, don't remember what he said, I will quote, I happen to have a co uh, copy here. For the stability in our part of Europe, American and NATO presence in our region is necessary. The US presence in the Baltic Sea region is crucial and has a clear threshold effect. We welcome the US ambition to increase its presence in Europe through the European Reassurance Initiative. And Sweden has been and will continue to be an active partner with NATO. From a Swedish perspective, NATO has a key role to ensure stability in the Baltic Sea. So there it is. So now I can talk about other things. Uh, so we, we've, we've responded to that, and I think it's very clear. Um, and I happen to wear this pin, which is Sweden and NATO, and uh, it doesn't mean I have an opinion on the future, but it means I'm a, a proud partner to NATO, and I think there is still room to develop this partnership beyond what we're doing today, and I will get into that. Um, because the EOP, which was launched at Wales, as you remember, has inspired us or forced us to focus on, on different ways forward and to prioritize. And uh, the developments in our region, of course, have underlined the need to adapt and complement our partnership to what it used to be. And as you are aware, we have three priority areas. It's political dialogue, it's exercises, and it's information sharing. The three key areas we have identified so far. And we think the cooperation areas has to build on the notion of mutual, it, it should be mutually beneficial, because otherwise you will not have any political energy into it. So it has to be mutually beneficial, and there we have, it has been facilitated by the developments in our region, both from a NATO perspective and from a Swedish perspective, we see the need for more cooperation. And then exactly how it is developed, how it is designed and what is possible, where are the red lines from our perspective, and where are the red lines from a NATO perspective, we notice when we reach them. We try to focus on the areas of possible future cooperation, not on the red lines. We will know when we reach them, and we will tell each other. So, uh, and the established process on the Baltic Sea security is maybe the most concrete and politically relevant example of the developments since Wales. Uh, as you know, we have a, 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 a cooperation, Sweden, Finland, and NATO, where we sit down biannually, updating our and compare our assessments on the developments in the Baltic Sea region. So that's a very clear and concrete example of what we have achieved as a partner nation. But we have done more than that. And let me mention a few examples. We have an extended dialogue in the civil committee, the SEPS committee of NATO, where the Ministry of Justice uh, is represented uh, together with my delegation. Uh, very fruitful discussions there on resilience, on total defense concept, etc., etc. 
We've had meetings in the high-level task force on conventional arms control. We have meetings in the proliferation committee. We are participating in the science and technology organization. Uh, we have decided to join the cyber center in Estonia. We have declared our intention at least to also join the Stratcom Center in Latvia, in Riga. Uh, we participated in the CMX 16 exercise, which was a sort of scenario uh, very much focusing in our own re region and the challenges um, emanating from a, a, a full-blown conflict in, in our own neighborhood. And that was really useful and we have some follow-up work to do together with Finland and NATO. And uh, as mentioned before, last Friday, for the first time, we participated in a NATO plus two, 28 plus two meeting, uh, foreign ministers meeting, where Sweden and Finland were seated with the other NATO foreign ministers and also the high representative Mogherini was invited and it was focusing on future EU NATO cooperation. So um, we, we, we certainly think that there is more room uh, for developing this partnership and we think there is a need from the NATO side and also from our side to do that. Um, and I would also like to say that of course we have communicated that Sweden is a strong supporter of closer cooperation between the EU and NATO. And the timing is right. We're in the run-up for the European Council in June and, um, and the NATO summit and we have to discuss how to better coordinate our efforts and our capabilities and also how to do the division of labor. And when we're talking about defense capacity building or projecting stability in our neighborhood, I think it's also important not to just buy the buzzwords, but also to look very um, seriously into what added value could different actors bring to this? Because we're already, already doing a lot of things bilaterally through UN agencies, through the EU, and what should be the added value of NATO? So that discussion has to be uh, concluded, I think, before we, uh, we take any decisions. Well, then, shortly on the expectations for the summit, we hope, we still don't have the invitations, not all of them anyway, but we hope to be invited both at the level of uh, heads of government, uh, uh, foreign ministers and defense ministers. So, um, and whether it's in 28 plus two format or any other remains to be seen, but we will certainly discuss uh, areas of national interest for us, including uh, the Baltic Sea uh, developments, but also uh, the southern neighborhood. Uh, and I think then the summit will be very much about balances, balance between EU and NATO, balance between deterrence and dialogue, a balance between East and South, and maybe also um, between for forward presence and reinforcements. But I leave that to the military experts, will, which, which will speak, uh, who will speak after me. So I stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> we will get back to you with questions. Now I would like to give the floor to, to Ambassador uh, Pirita Asuma. Please, what is your perspective from the Finnish side? First of all, many thanks for the kind of an invitation to Folkofer Svaro, Swedish Atlantic Council. I'm very honored to be um, addressing su such a distinguished um, audience and happy to see some familiar faces also in the audience. Uh, in this session, we are supposed to discuss the influence of, of evolving NATO on the security of Finland and Sweden. And from the fin Finnish perspective, I would like to offer um, three um, observations. The first one on NATO's role in the changed security environment around the Baltic Sea. The second one on the change in the NATO and focus of the Finnish partnership with NATO. And third one on the Finnish contribution to the regional security and to conclude a few words on the security political debate in Finland. But to start with um, NATO's role in the Baltic Sea uh, region, I would argue that today Finland and Sweden are relevant for NATO, and NATO is relevant for Finland and Sweden in a new way. And this is a result uh, of the fundamental change in the European security due to Russia's actions, as we already heard from the uh, previous speakers. 
And this change um, in security environment is also um, reflected um, in our region, where we have witnessed a tangible increase in Russia's military activity, as, um, as uh, Defence Minister Hulkvist uh, explained. And this is obviously not something that we would like to see in our neighbourhood. In our view, the increased tensions in our region underline NATO's role in providing security in Europe and emphasize the importance of the transatlantic security link. So this is very much also the view of Sweden. NATO, Finland and Sweden share the same security environment and the same security concerns. And thus cooperation in addressing the situation has become a necessity. Among the European security actors, NATO has had the key role in reacting to the security situation in the Baltic Sea region. And NATO's adaptation and assurance measures have increased security and stability in the Baltic Sea region, including the security of Finland. And it is in Finland's interest that NATO's common defence and deterrence are credible and that NATO maintains also a dialogue with Russia. And we expect that Warsaw Summit outcomes deliver on these both accounts. Secondly, a few words um, on the change in the nature and focus of the Finnish partnership with NATO. In the new uh, security situation, the focus of our partnership has switched from crisis management to political dialogue related to our national security. An excellent example of this deepening dialogue was the participation of Finland and Sweden in the NATO's foreign ministers' meeting last Friday, as we already heard. NATO, Finland and Sweden have also launched a dialogue on the Baltic Sea security, as Ambassador Malmquist just pointed out. Our political dialogue is coupled with practical military cooperation that directly benefits our national defence um, capability. And to give you a few examples, um, in 2016, Finland will participate in 19 NATO-led exercises. Furthermore, we are opening some of our largest national exercises to NATO. Increased information exchange and shared situational awareness have become prerequisites for addressing common threats, be it in our close neighbourhood or elsewhere in and around the Euro-Atlantic area. Thirdly, I would like to emphasise that Finland's national defence and resilience are an important contribution to the security of our neighbourhood and thereby contribute to NATO security as well. It is therefore in NATO's interest that Finland has a strong, credible and interoperable defence and that our cooperation gears towards this objective. Our defence poster is based on territorial defence, general conscription and a well-trained reserve army of 230,000 men. Defence spending will be increased in order to maintain a credible defence capacity. Capabilities are being developed to counter hybrid threats, including information campaigns. Legislative work is ongoing to enhance our national readiness of the defence forces and to enable Finland to give and receive international assistance, including military aid. Legislation is also ongoing. Um, uh, is, uh, legislation concerning intelligence is o also being developed. Our national defence is supported by what we call comprehensive security, total fair here in Sweden, a wide cooperation between government, business community, and civil society in normal times as well as in times of crises. And this aspect has found interest among NATO's member states. To conclude, a word on the security political debate in Finland. I'm afraid it might not be as lively as here in Sweden. However, it was certainly animated by an independent assessment on the effects of Finland's possible NATO membership that was published um, in the end of April. And the key finding of this assessment was the interdependency of security political decisions made by Finland and Sweden. 
this study will provide um, useful food for thought in the preparations of uh, the white paper on the government's foreign and security policy. The white paper is due to be submitted to the parliament in June. Of course, it is far too early to predict the conclusions, but one would expect the paper to make at least two observations. The first one on the unpredictability and complexity of the security environment, and the second on the need for increased security cooperation with Sweden, with other Nordic countries, with NATO, and with the US, among others. And Finland commitments as member of the European Union will be given also due consideration in this context. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I now leave the, the floor to Jonas Hagren. We look forward to your military perspective. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, distinguished guests. Uh, and I would also like to say it's a pleasure and honor to be here and to address an audience with so much uh, knowledge. Uh, so um, our main task, of course, within the Swedish Armed Forces is uh, putting words into action and then into operational effect. But I will touch uh, two areas uh, as I, first of all, uh, NATO uh, cooperation as, and as a partner nation uh, and the importance of that, a few pointers. And then finally, I will, will talk a little bit about our deepened cooperation with Finland as I'm flanked by my Finnish friends here. It would be rather rude not to take, bring it up. And this is also the first time I am presenting with my reading glasses, which <laughs> ap appropriately is also being filmed. Um, that is also a milestone. Uh, going on then to, to uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, the cooperation within NATO. Uh, in the West, NATO is the organization defining international standards for practical military cooperation, so-called interoperability which in turn provides the foundation for the Swedish capability to cooperate in international crisis management, regardless whether it is within the framework of the UN, the EU or NATO. Thus, NATO standards also provides the foundation for Nordic cooperation. One condition for the Swedish Armed Forces development towards a high capability of practical cooperation with others is close cooperation with NATO. And this in turn means that a high level of interoperability in relation to NATO standards increases our technical and operative capability to give and receive military support. Within the framework of the NATO of the NATO partnership, a number of tools for increased interoperability and capability development have been offered to partner nations. Sweden does, for example, participate in exercises, the planning and review process, and the NATO certification mechanism. And this, in turn, has contributed to the development of the Swedish Armed Forces interoperability, which in turn facilitates cooperations with other nations in different operations. NATO is the driver of military interoperability, and almost all of our international partners are members or partners to NATO. Looking a little bit then to exercises uh, with NATO and with other partner nations, the Swedish geographical focus for exercises in the Nordic region, in particular the Baltic Sea region, is a driver. Sweden strives to exercise with an outset in national needs stemming from defense planning and national needs for capability development. Furthermore, Sweden aims to be able to contribute together with others to manage a situation with a deteriorating level of security. Through our NATO partnership, we gain access to a large number of exercises, for example, Trident Juncture exercise that will take place in 2018. And this exercise will be conducted in our neighborhood and we will also be conducting it together with our partners Finland. Moving on then finally to our cooperation with Finland. Finland and Sweden has, as you all know, a deepened bilateral defense cooperation. And it entails Air Force, Navy, Army, logistics and joint operations, uh, to name a few. The great effect and win-win for the defense forces are operational effect and development of capabilities. 
the deepened defense cooperation between Finland and Sweden has a very high or the highest priority in the Swedish armed forces. According to our Swedish Defense Bill of 2015, the aim is to include contingency planning and preparations for joint action in a variety of scenarios in the bilateral defense cooperation. And such planning and preparations shall be complementary to, but separate from, national operational planning in our two countries. Finland and Sweden have a similar approach and ambition in a cooperation partnership with NATO. Participating in NATO exercises are closely coordinated and are an important part of our capability development. And Sweden, as I said quite recently, Sweden and Finland will take part in, for example, Baltops 2016, but also planning to participate in Trident Juncture 2018. So these are a few examples of our cooperation within the NATO framework as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last but not least, uh, Charles Salonius Pasternak, please. Thank you. Uh, I uh, also honored to be invited here. Thank you, Lena. Uh, and uh, wonderful to see you here. I have the, um, the privilege of, I think, being the only non-official here. Uh, so I thought I would then um, try to be a little bit more critical. So don't take all of my comments as the sum total of my views. But since I have probably about four and a half minutes left, uh, I'll, I'll only present some. We heard about. Um, uh, a focus on kind of 360, NATO will focus. We talked about east and south, that's, that's enough, but there's, if you simplify things, still two directions. One is west, and here while we heard that the US remains committed to NATO, which is probably true, um, I'm still a little concerned that unless European members as a whole do quite a bit more, get quite a bit better at actually developing capabilities, at some point the US may just say, we're a part of this, but not as much as you'd like. So 360 should also mean some really strong public diplomacy towards Congress, I would say. Uh, the other direction is then the North. And here I will just say that NATO is, and probably should be very careful about what it does up North in the Arctic. The reason I say this, so there, there are multiple reasons related to what NATO does in an organization, but we cannot forget or ignore that if NATO moves further up north actively, it will be viewed by Russia as a military incursion into its core area, into the one area that guarantees Russia's superpower status, that is its nuclear second strike capabilities, Kuala Peninsula, Murmansk, etc. So some, some, not words of warning, but something to consider. Um, we've heard about reassurance and deterrence. And my question is, have we heard enough about it? Uh, we heard about hybrid. Uh, Minister Hultqvist talked about hybrid being a national focus. Uh, we also heard Finland has this. Um, and it's been a pleasure for the last year and a half to travel around Europe and have a really good story to tell. But. Um, what I'm wondering is, what is NATO's ability to in any way pressure its member states to actually do this? If NATO is having a difficulty to pressure its member states to do some things militarily in terms of capability development, how is it going to be able to do this in a much broader societal aspect? Related to this, um, just heard uh, earlier that Russia has this tactical operational military advantage. Um, in the East, NATO is adapting. But if I'm looking really honestly at the defense budgets, at how they're being used, at the really sporadic cooperation in the end between NATO partners, I have to wonder how really serious one is about this adaptation um, and for how long one sees this is going to uh, occur. And uh, while I recognize solutions can't be copied from one country to another, if one is genuinely worried about this being a long-term challenge, about volume, Russia having a greater volume, then I would expect far more NATO members, especially in the East, to say, why don't we return to something that allows for two things, volume and a national societal binding or cohesion, national service. Doesn't need to be military national service, but national service. And then I guess as a, as a third 
if I had first this focus, reassurance to deterrence, is it enough? Third uh, observation, Assurance to deterrence, yes, that is undoubtedly where NATO is heading. Um, and it means in practice exercising Article 5. Article 5 exercises. We've heard Finland and Sweden uh, have in effect participated in, in such exercises. Here, um, it'll be interesting to see how Finland and maybe Sweden deal with this policy-wise. The military certainly benefits from this, no doubt. Um, but whether or not the Finnish and Swedish political systems will be able to adjust as quickly to explain why Finland and Sweden are now effectively exercising and practicing defense of NATO will be a very interesting challenge. And finally, related to this, uh, yes, Finland has opened some national exercises. This is also a challenge because we've already seen one exercise, Arrow 16, which is an annual, obviously with a different number, national exercise, was in the public view very quickly turned into an American exercise or a NATO exercise, even if the proportion of Finnish soldiers to Americans was about 2,000 to 100, 150. Um, so something to consider for Finland and Sweden, how much do we actually want others to come in so that we don't get drawn in, especially in Russian propaganda, as hosting big NATO offensive exercises. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charmaine. <laughs> well, you have uh, certainly given us uh, uh, four different perspectives that we will bring with us. And I open up for questions. Um, I can start myself by asking the, the ambassadors. Uh, Håkan Malmqvist, you mentioned that uh, uh, there is definitely more room for developing the partnership and we, we play a key role in, in the Baltic Sea area and so on. Uh, how is it with our partnership? Is it that uncontroversial as uh, we hear from different sources when you uh, walk around in the NATO headquarters and meet representatives from, from other countries? What do you say? They are all very polite, and uh, I think, it, I, I, from my perspective, it's quite uncontroversial. Uh, and of course, we get some comments now and then, including at the ministerial level, that, uh, well, it's good to see you, shall we continue to meet 28 plus 2, or... Well, I stop there. I mean, that's those kind of comments we get all the time, but it's very friendly. And I think that, as I said, we have been helped by the fact that uh, there is a common, a mutual interest of actually developing this partnership and the Baltic Sea cooperation is the most concrete and politically relevant example. Then there will be others and we're doing a lot. I mean, on a daily basis, which we didn't touch upon now because it's not that politically interesting, but we're doing a lot and there is more room to develop it. And then just to comment on, on Charlie's uh, Article 5 exercise, and maybe Jonas will do that also, but from my perspective, that's, um, from a Swedish perspective, we exercise. Whether it's Article 5, Article 4, Article something else, it doesn't matter much. We're a partner nation, we're, we're exercising to build our national capabilities. And it's, it doesn't mean that we're part of the NATO concept of protecting NATO nations, NATO member nations. We're exercising because it gives something back to us. And hopefully we can provide also some input for a possible future cooperation in our region, whether it is as a partner nation or as a member. Mm. Ambassador uh, Asuma, what do you say? Well, for me, it's always very easy to take the floor after Håkan, since we always agree on most things. And I, I can always say that I just very much uh, is of the same um, opinion. But concerning this, uh, how Finland and Sweden are seen in NATO, I think it is very uncontroversial. And I see really a qualitative step here. I, I was uh, actually deputy at Finnish Mission to NATO between 2005-2009, and now I came back six years later. So there is much more appreciation for the role we play now. 
we played a very important role in times of um, crisis management when that was the focus of, of, of NATO since we were important um, cont troop contributors. But now we are really talking about a shared security environment where the role of Finland and Sweden is also relevant uh, for NATO, as NATO is relevant uh, for Finland and Sweden. And I think this is very well understood by, by NATO countries. And I, I, I am very much also um, of the same opinion when it comes to exercises. They, they are vital for our own national defense capabilities. That, that is what we are exercising. We are not exercising of being part of, of NATO's common defense, since as a Panto country, we are not covered by Article 5. And I would say that there is a clear distinction. We can be very close partners, but there is a distinction. We are not covered by Article 5, so we don't participate. In, in, in Article 5 exercises as a full member, we participate in how to cooperate in times of crisis and how to develop our own um, defence capabilities. Thank you. Thank you. Jonas Hagren, would you like to add anything about these uh, exercises and, and when it comes to Article 5? Well, we are not uh, really concerned whether it's Article 5 or Article 4, it's a political question. We are more concerned on will the exercise give operational effect and will it actually develop our capabilities and can we become better partners uh, in cooperation with other nations uh, within a crisis or may I dare say a war scenario. That is the main driver for us. Uh, and, and what we can see now in, in our region, uh, cooperation is the key word to be successful. Uh, whatever alliance you're a member of, or whatever organization you're part of, or whatever bilateral, it is about cooperation if we are going to be able to handle the situation. And also predictability of knowing your uh, neighbors' uh, actions, how are they going to do, how are they thinking, and so on. And that you only get within the framework of exercises on all levels. And I think it's very nice to hear. And have you have seen how also the political level is now being actively engaged. And I know there's a lot of work being done there, so it's not, I'm not being critical here, but we can see it uh, from the CMX 16 as a very good example, which of course helps us immensely in our uh, military strategic options. Thank you. Now, Anders Olli Lund, please. Thank you. My name is Anders Olli Lund. I have a question to Håkan and maybe Jonas and uh, perhaps Virita also. And when I started to work with NATO now 10 years ago, we received an instruction from the government, the same social democratic government as we are today, and it said that for Sweden, any cooperation with NATO is possible except guarantees. Anything but guarantees. I think that instruction at that time was meant as some kind of limit behind which the government could relax. And we read it rather as, uh, as an enormous possibility. So my question today is, is this instruction still valid? With NATO, everything is possible except guarantees. Thank you. Let us bring in one more question. Just give it to Paul Jonsson, just uh, on your side. Uh, yeah. Paul Johnson, Swedish Atlantic Council. Uh, question first to the to Finnish ambassador. It seems like the NATO opinion polls hasn't really moved in Finland after the war in Ukraine, but they, they have in Sweden. I was wondering why the public perception seemed to be different in Finland than in Sweden. Secondly, short question to Charlie. Very important issue about enhancing resilience, also difficult to do and uh, creating peer pressure. Isn't the trick to integrate these seven baseline requirements into NATO defense planning process, where they have a review uh, on how to assure also things as survival of the government, mass casualties and so forth? Thank you. We have like three more minutes and I hope to bring in uh, two more questions. We'll see if we can manage. Please, uh, we, uh, if you can, may give us uh, brief answers and we have two more brief questions. Uh, who would like to start? Håkan? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, the instructions, that's what I meant with the red line. 
underlying discussion. I, uh, there may be red lines uh, somewhere, but this is a political question. We get our instructions from Stockholm, um, um, prepared by the foreign ministry, the defense ministry, the justice ministry, because we're also into to, uh, those parts of so the civilian cooperation. And um, I think everything is possible. The sky is the limit as far as we uh, interpret our instructions. So mutual guarantees, of course, is a red line. And of course, also from the NATO point of view, everything else is possible. Thank you. Pirita Asuma. Yes, there was a special um, question uh, posed to me concerning the opinion polls in, in Finland. And this is something we have been actually following for a number of years. And, and we know that NATO support in Finland has never... Uh, I don't think it's on. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. So there was a um, question on the, the opinion polls in, in, in Finland. And I was saying that this is something that we have actually been following um, constantly for, for um, more than 10 years. And we are well, very well aware that we have had never more than about 30% at the highest the support for uh, NATO, NATO membership. And it is, of course, uh, there is a clear difference between Finnish and Swedish um, opinion polls. And, it, it, and you are very right um, saying that the crisis in Ukraine has raised the support for NATO membership here in Sweden, but not, not in Finland. And why is that? Um, I do suppose that it has to do with, with um, history and, and with different rhetorics. And I think, as we heard today, that we actually share the security assessment. We, we see the same threats. But we have a different tradition of, of talking about these threats, and especially talking about threats publicly. And I'm sure that this is perhaps the main reason why, why there is less support uh, for NATO membership in Finland than here uh, in Sweden. Thank you very much. Charles Salonius, uh, Quickly, I'm really glad to hear everything you said about Article 5 and exercises, and I'm not surprised that the, the, the pros who know all of this see this. I'm a little concerned that maybe the general public or some parliamentarians in Finland, for instance, don't know this. But um, that's maybe others' challenge. Uh, I agree, yes, you have to integrate it and require it, otherwise it's hard to see how you would get resilience built in. And I can't resist saying something about NATO. Um, some of it has to do with national myths. I agree that threat perception is the same. We talk about it differently. But there's one key difference, which is the general public in Finland feels Finland still has a robust defense, national defense system and capability. The general public in Sweden clearly doesn't, based on polls. And this, then, you're more scared if you don't think you can deal with the possible threat. I think that partially explains the difference also. Thank you very much. We, uh, unfortunately, we, we need to wrap up here. Uh, just a quick question for Jonas Hagren. Uh, uh, they're discussing the, the host nation support agreement uh, in parliament uh, today. Uh, what are the expected, uh, um, what do you expect from the armed forces? Um, will there be more exercises? Do you see that this will uh, facilitate and in, in what, or is it mainly on the political side that it will facilitate? Uh, the host nation support agreement is uh, whether it's being will the decision will be taken today or not. I don't know yet. Um, maybe some of you know in the room. I haven't followed it. But uh, whether that decision is taken, we need to exercise giving and receiving support. Uh, and with this, uh, um, uh, and we have an MOU, of course, ready. Uh, it will be much easier, of course, to, to facilitate. But uh, this is something we will, will go on exercises, whether it will be delayed for a year or not, uh, because we need to exercise that anyway, if I might say so. But of course, uh, a decision will make that easier, and it will also be easier to put it in a framework and, and to have the MOU in place as a backdrop to really decide on what support do we need and how do we do it, and also to have it in a structured and methodical uh, way. Thank you very much. Håkan Malmqvist, Pirita Asunma, Jonas Hagren och Charles Salonius Pasternak. Thank you so much for being here. Now it is time for concluding remarks and we will get those from uh, the Polish side. And I welcome General Romuald Ratacak, who is the advisor to the head of National Security Bureau. 
Okay. Please. Romal Ratacek is, uh, as I said, advisor to the chief of the National Security Bureau since uh, nine, uh, uh, 2015. His background includes positions such as acting director of the National Defense Academy in Warsaw, director of the Department of Military Affairs and director of the Department of International Cooperation in Poland. A warm welcome to you and the floor is yours. Uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am really honored to be here and to, to talk about the an evolving NATO a Polish uh, view. However, I do have uh, make a, some kind of a remark, a reservation. There is no something like an official or declared uh, Polish view on uh, evolution of NATO. I would rather present a main trust of thinking uh, in, the, in, the, in the Polish government, uh, uh, in the presidential administration, in, in, in some academia. Uh, the, so the, the overall view and overall uh, approach to the, to the evolution of NATO. And one thing, when you are the last uh, speaker, usually you, on the way, you find out that your speaking souls are eaten up, and you have to, how to say, to uh, to adapt to the to the to the to the, to the new situation. And one more, one more thing. I always, when I when I attend this type of conference, and uh, there are many of them uh, these days about about NATO, I um, I think what is the real influence of such a conferences on 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 the evolution of NATO, of the of the of the, of the changes, and I try to to find out any any kind of a com any kind of a comparison and. Uh, and uh, this time I return to my long forgotten background. I am a, 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 I am a, how to say a quantum quantum physics from the from from the origin. So I remember the the. the Heisenberg uh, uncertainty and or Heisenberg undeterminacy principle. It means that. Uh, uh, Every observation and every uh, every measurement of a certain object, uh, from its nature, influences uh, influences this uh, this object, and uh, influences the object and changing and is changing this object. So I hope that I to say this uh, this. Uh, uh, Quantity of the discussion will be turned out into a quality of uh, of changes uh, uh, within the NATO, and uh, uh, with uh, NATO facing security challenges in the hectic time prior to the incoming summit of summit of the alliance, we try to find answers to the question: How should uh, NATO evolve? In my opinion, we should look at our expectations for deliverables from Warsaw NATO summit from a broader perspective that I would describe as uh, from Newport through Warsaw and beyond. We should have a really a much broader perspective in this respect. And looking at uh, NATO's history lasting for more than uh, 67 years, it is clear that from the very beginning the alliance uh, uh, had been in the process of permanent transformation. It is something natural for a living and a vibrant organization. And ability to transform and uh, adapt is, uh, so to say, immanently embedded in NATO's DNA. That this is the institution can, uh, that can uh, transform. In the beginning of the 90s, historic changes in the Central and Eastern Europe led to the dramatic changes in the security environment in our part of the world. When I say our, I mean the Central and Eastern Europe. And NATO entered at that time the, the second phase in its history, so called the post cold uh, war era. In uh, global terms, some are saying about the end of history. Uh, and uh, and it was for 20 years, and it was for 20 years uh, until the, the events in Ukraine uh, brought about a substantial and abrupt change uh, in the perception and assessment of the geostrategic security environment. Suddenly, many of us realized that crucial historical dilemmas and security concerns uh, thought to have vanished with the collapse of the Soviet Union or leaving only as Polish phobias uh, have been dormant only and uh, have been dormant for some years and now they are reawakened, uh, reawakened again. And uh, so the post-Cold War, it's over. 
it's over with the with this uh, with these events and the, the 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 previous summit the summit in Newport marks the point when NATO uh, entered the third phase in its history. Uh, after post cold War period, there is no any any, any short name for uh, for uh, for this, uh, and um, it. It uh, became obvious that NATO must respond to those developments, uh, to this, uh, to this uh, game-changing factor by internal adaptation, mainly in the military context, but, uh, but not only, but also in the political sphere. Uh, different military measures agreed in Newport with the readiness action plan of particular importance constitute uh, a backbone of NATO response to the current and future global challenges. We have a visible shift in priorities from capabilities for crisis management, expeditionary operations to collective defense, capabilities for high intensity full spectrum, full spectrum of missions. Uh, Looking back at summit in Wales, uh, which was a turning point from the third to phase two to the phase uh, three, uh, we can say that it was, in a sense, reactive in nature. It means that it uh, was a response to the new unexpected uh, developments, but with the old, then existing uh, uh, procedures and, uh, and, and measures. It is why the, the, the summit in Warsaw is uh, so important. After two years uh, from summit in Wales, we have a much clearer picture and better understanding of nature and complexity of changes in the security environment. NATO is facing uh, two distinctive strategic challenges on eastern and southern flanks that need to be addressed simultaneously. And Russia is a common denominator, potential threat, the main threat in the east, and an important, mainly destabilizing factor in the south. We, look, we should look at Russia also from this, uh, from this, uh, this perspective. In Warsaw, we have to review the status of implementation of uh, Newport decision and give new directions and guidelines uh, uh, to the future. In the military dimension, the summit must respond to the need of reinforcing the eastern flank and at the same time to improve NATO capabilities to address challenges coming from the south. Evolving NATO must build uh, full spectrum deterrence and defense as a key deliverable from the Warsaw Summit. In this respect, Alliance must move beyond the readiness action plan, especially on the eastern flank. This must include forward deployment and permanent or persistent presence uh, of multinational NATO forces in the Baltic states and in Poland that needs to be supported by a prepositioning of adequate equipment and war fighting stocks uh, both for VJTF uh, and European and American follow-on follow forces. And NATO must be prepared, especially in its military capabilities, uh, must be prepared for immediate deployment in extremis, so to say. When the situation is really extreme, the deployment must be, must be very fast. And uh, we also, we as a NATO, must authorize SECURE, so Supreme Allied Commander Europe, to conduct extensive scenario planning that can drive uh, the development of NATO military efforts. And uh, in my opinion, uh, this is not how to say a, a unified voice, some political pre-authorization needs to be granted to NATO operational commanders for specifically predefined provocative scenarios and actions. In order not to wait, in order not to wait for the long-lasting decision-making process in NATO to be concluded and to have a, to have a, to have a final decision, and also uh, NATO must uh, maintain nuclear deterrence as an important element of uh, of, uh, of 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 NATO of NATO forces, and uh, NATO must also step up its nuclear training and messaging. And also the messaging that the message of, 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 a, of a nuclear policy of NATO must be clear and well understood by the, by the others. And NATO must also integrate uh, its uh, conventional and, uh, and nuclear doctrine. It means that the, the nuclear forces must be included into, in, in, into, into a certain common doctrine. 
Uh, of course, there are, there are other aspects, uh, uh, the, the maximizing of resilience of, of, of NATO members, uh, bolstering of NATO uh, cyber defenses, uh, uh, or creating a continuous strategic awareness and procedures as well for rapid, rapid decision making, which is, which is actually a crucial. And, and uh, last but not least, it's strengthening the partnership. And this includes the the, including the country of the, of the Baltic Sea region and uh, uh, Sweden and Finland in particular. And, 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 and in my opinion, I mean, the, the Sweden and Finland should be designated as a premier interoperable partners. This type of, uh, how to say, of, uh, of status uh, should be brought into the readiness action plan, including VJTF, uh, uh, and also. Uh, to, to provide an access, to, to, to provide a mechanism and access to the, to, the, to the North Atlantic Council Military Committee and international staff. And as far as the, this, uh, this unspoken questions uh, hanging uh, somewhere over here, um, and uh, or a ta even a taboo question. So uh, w w what I would say, I would say it's, it's really better to be in a good company. It's uh, much better to work uh, in a good company, and it's really much better to drink in a in a good company, especially especially when you have to drink whiskey on the rocks. <laughs> and uh, to really to really to really to really to really sum up, uh, uh, let me make a, a comparison to illustrate uh, the changing nature of the military capabilities uh, of the Alliance. Uh, during the Cold War, the phase the one uh, I, I, I mentioned, in the phase one in NATO existence, the military posture of the Alliance resembled a, a heavy fist, organized, structured, and prepared to defend its members uh, against Soviet threat. A strong fist capable to punch the well-known enemy. During the phase two in NATO history, the post-Cold War era, uh, lasting for more than two, two decades, NATO military capabilities started to look like an open and flexible hand suited rather, um, suited rather to, to make a subtle tweak, uh, to play various instruments and tunes, uh, a hand rather ready for handshake or slap at the latest, not to blow. And in the phase three, the f phase uh, we are already now, and we will, how to say, uh, we will be in this phase uh, for the incoming future as a result, of, uh, partially of the results of decision taken in Warsaw, at least in some respects, areas, uh, in some areas, uh, NATO must come back to its roost, rule, roots. Sorry, while preserving its cohesion and flexibility, the alliance should remain as an open hand for friends and partners. But its military posture must be transformed into a powerful hand, fully capable of clenching into a robust fist when situation requires. And referring to the to, to the first part of the of, of the uh, of the first session of our meeting, I would uh, conclude with. Uh, NATO to face new security challenges must return to its main raison d'etre, the collective defense. But this cannot be a simple U-turn or withdrawal from what has been achieved. This must be rather a process of uh, process along an ascending spiral uh, to find itself on a qualitatively new position over the old well-known ground, the process that can be named as back to the future. As for the question of NATO evolution, we should expect uh, in Warsaw decisions uh, to move from assurance to fully fledged and full spectrum deterrence and defense. In short, for evolving NATO, the driving per, uh, principle, the mantra from the post Cold War era, out of area or out of business, must be replaced by the philosophy of in area including the Baltic Sea region or in trouble. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, General Ratacek, for your, your remarks. And now I would like to hand over to Joran Lenmarker, who is the chairman of the Swedish Atlantic Council. Um, your closing remarks. And uh, the floor is yours, Joran. Thank you. Uh, 
Could I say that uh, a very central part, as we heard, is to see to it that we defend the European peace order. 20th century catastrophes led Europe to elaborate from the Helsinki Accords 75 up to the Paris Accords 1990 on a peace order or a security order, whatever we call it. We have a responsibility to defend that. All of us, all European countries. Because we know what will happen if we didn't have it, if we go back to the old orders of Europe, which is not very encouraging, if I put it mildly. Who are then to support it? Of course, each of us European countries individually, but also the different organizations that we have. Council of Europe is one very important, setting the standards of human rights and democracy, very important part of security order because it's built also not only on hard security but all on the values. The European Union is certainly a very important part of the security order. Also when it comes to more particular security, for example supporting Ukraine and the other countries around Russia when it comes to the Eastern Partnership, a very important part of European security. Also the sanctioned regime against Russia, which is a, a regime to support the security order, saying it's not correct, right, to occupy and, and uh, attack a uh, uh, neighboring country, Ukraine and Crimea res respectively. NATO is, of course, also a very central part of defending the European uh, peace order. We could for, imagine for, for a while that we didn't have NATO. How would it, Europe look like? particularly for small countries to the east. I think we would have a, a rather terrible situation without NATO as an organization. If we didn't have NATO, we had to invent it. And particularly, of course, NATO is important because it involves the United States of America. There is a distinguished, was a distinguished Finnish ambassador, Max Jakobson, one of the perhaps leading in the in the Finnish uh, diplomacy, who said that the United States is the indispensable European power, if I quote him. And I think that has been and is still relevant for the 21st century, with the United States as a central part of the stability and peace of, of Europe. And in this respect, of course, NATO is for all of Europe, in all of Europe, NATO, including the United States present in Europe, is absolutely central to keeping the peace in, in Europe. We are eight countries in the northern part of Europe. We call them sometimes the Nordic Baltic Eight, NB8. Five Nordic countries, three Baltic countries. Small countries in the sense that we are in populations less than 10 million each. Some very much smaller than that. Uh, and we are also very dependent on NATO. All of us, including Sweden and Finland, and that has been demonstrated through this conference. But I would say that for us to cooperate on security, NATO is the prime organization, also for Sweden and Finland, setting the standards, having the different exercises, helping us to build both our very hard uh, security, namely defense, but also the cooperation that is there with consultations, etc. Sweden took a rather important step when the parliament, not unanimous, unanimously, but close to, uh, issued the solidarity declaration, ending the idea that Sweden could be neutral or standing aside, saying that Sweden is part of the European security, that Sweden has to have solidarity with its neighbors, with Europe at large. And uh, I think that is essentially what NATO is about. To quote what uh, General Ratajsak said about drinking together, I think it's a question about family, sticking together, that the West has to stick together, particularly in times when we are challenged from different sorts through corruption, through dictatorship, uh, and, and also perhaps aggressive nationalism. 
We have to be there in the family, solving our problems together. I think this is the bottom line. Then you can discuss techn uh, technology, uh, particular solutions, etc. But certainly NATO in that sense is one very vital part of the Western family and of the European family. Could I finally, as the chair of the Swedish Atlantic Council and also on behalf of the Finnish Atlantic Council, thank Volker Fischer and the uh, Polish Embassy for the support for this conference. Thank you. By that we conclude.